Okay, well, thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, what I'm going to do, as uh, has been said, is talk probably for about half an hour. I don't mind if we have our questions during the talk or at the end. So if you want to interrupt me, feel free. I might have to rattle through some at the end, though, and we might use up the question time during the presentation. So uh, feel free to run it either way. Okay, well, what I'm going to talk about is the prevention and population care theme within the uh, BRC. Uh, it's by far the most applied, i.e. closer to patients, uh, of all the themes within the BRC. Uh, it's really more uh, what we would call second translation from patients into populations than the first in man type of research, which is in the rest of the BRC. So it's slightly different from some of the other themes, and some of it actually may be a little bit more relevant to you um, in terms of the things we're looking at. So, like uh, most of the BRC, we're interested in rapid translation of research um, discovery, um, but what we look at, um, which is unusual within the BRC, is that interface, not just within hospital settings, but out within um, communities in primary care. We've got two big clinical themes, uh, cardiovascular disease and uh, we've got a new theme around uh, chronic kidney disease. And you may say, well, why are we focused on that? Because cardiovascular disease is actually the number one cause of death uh, on the planet still. But of more importance than that, it's the number uh, one and three causes of disability, or the major outcomes of vascular disease, heart attack and stroke, are the number one and number three causes of disability. And of course, that's important because it's people suffering an attack of some kind, and then being um, relatively less able as a consequence of that. And that has big significance for health systems because it adds to cost. So they're very costly conditions to look after. And in fact, cardiovascular disease is the world's number one cause of premature death. We've got to die from something, but we'd prefer to shove it as late as possible. So that's what we do. Um, and potentially, although we're a new theme, we've only been running a couple of years or so within the BRC, um, what we potentially might be able to do is use some of the population uh, data that we develop that might impinge on some of the discovery within the re rest of the BRC. We may identify a health need um, that actually stimulates a, a, a development uh, in basic science. And indeed, we might also be able to test some candidate technologies um, out in our community populations. And we've also, unusually for the BSC, got a methodological program which I'll close with. So we've got five themes. Um, we've got three population cohorts. Um, I'll go through each of these so you'll understand them um, as we uh, do the presentation. OxVASC, that's the longest running. That was established actually before the BRC. And, um, was uh, obviously continued to be funded in BRC 1 and 2. Ox Valve, that was established by the BRC, so that was a new one to Oxford. And Ox Wren, the renal one, was established within BRC 2, so that's only been running a couple of years. We've got an integrated healthcare theme, which is run via the George Institute, and that's interested in health service research and technologies, and I'll show you examples of all these as we go through. And the methodological theme is uh, non-clinical scientists, mainly statisticians and health economics, and you'll understand why when I come to that. So let's rattle through the five themes. OxVASC, PI is Peter Rothwell. Uh, it's a very well-developed theme, and it's actually had some very significant outputs over the years. Indeed, last year it was awarded the Queen's Award for um, Higher uh, Institution. Oh, sorry, principal investigator. So he leads the program. He's the senior scientist that leads the program of work. He's actually a, a neurologist and an epidemiologist. So he's a nerve man. Okay, so here we are with the uh, OxVASC uh, Ox program. Um, basically, what that did is it set up a large cohort of patients who suffered an acute event, either a transient ischemic attack, a stroke, a myocardial infarction, had an acute coronary syndrome, which is like myocardial infarction, uh, 
but it doesn't um, damage the whole heart wall. And these are aneurysms, and that's peripheral vascular disease affecting your uh, leg veins. And basically, what they did was have nine practices that referred all of these acute events into a specialist center. And basically, they did all sorts of things to these patients, in addition, obviously, to looking after them clinically. They weren't just left with their disorder. But they had a lot more measurement that would usually take place, and they agreed to take part in being followed up long term after the acute event. And of course, what that means is that this cohort who have had events, you can look back to their history, you can look and see whether there are things that might have determined them having an event, and you can look forward and see what happens to them subsequently. And there have been all sorts of research that's emanated from this long-standing cohort. One example, for example, um, was the ABCD score, which is a validated clinical decision rule. And what one of those is, is something that helps doctors decide whether something might be that disease rather than a different disease, because, of course, many diseases present with similar symptoms. And the reason why that's important is because here you've got patients who have suffered a, um, a transient ischemic attack, which is basically a temporary disruption of nerve function, perhaps some weakness, some giddiness, some difficulty speaking, some visual disturbance. And here is a group who were then intensively treated. And you can see that only a small proportion of them went on to get a stroke. But here's an untreated population, and this is what happens if you've had a transient ischemic attack, is over the next 10 days or so, about 6% of them develop a full-blown stroke. So for some individuals, it's a warning that they're going to get a stroke, but it's very difficult to diagnose because the symptoms may be very vague. And uh, what the ABCD rule did, based on clinical information collected from the cohort, was come up with a scoring system, which isn't perfect because here are the scores translated by patient presentations. And you can see it's only about a little over half of the patients with each of those scores actually has got transient ischemic attack, although it does get better. A higher proportion of patients do have um, transient ischemic attack at the higher scores. So it helps, but it's not perfect. And uh, indeed, uh, it's important because here's some data about patients who were admitted to hospital just with uh, blood pressure issues. And you can see most of those don't go on over the next um, two years to have any significant event. But those who have had a TIA in dark there, quite a high proportion um, actually do go on and have some sort of subsequent event. And even the ones who don't have TIA but present with similar symptoms to TIA have uh, quite a lot of events, have a sort of intermediate risk. So the reason why things like clinical decision rules are helpful in these acute settings is that you can try and intervene early and avert what might otherwise happen. But what you don't want to do is identify a lot of people who don't have that problem because obviously that's a lot of unnecessary treatment and potential cost to the healthcare system. So refining these scores will continue to be a function of the OXFAS group. More recently, what they've done is quite some interesting work. The United Kingdom has just introduced an aortic aneurysm. That's where the big artery in your abdomen dilates and it can then leak or burst and uh, it often is diagnosed at the point that it's leaked and it's then much riskier much more likely to die from it than if you identify it earlier and you just chop it out and put a plastic bit in so they're going to introduce a screening program which is for men over the age of 65 and what the group did using the OXFAS data is actually do a health economic evaluation of this screening program and actually came up with what they think would be a better schedule, which is rather than doing all men 65 to 75, they suggest on their data that the NHS should be screening 
only men smokers at the age of 65, and then at 75 do all men. And in fact, that would identify more life years saved than the current screening program, and actually you'd be doing fewer scans as well. So it would be what health economists call a dominant strategy. It's better and it's cheaper. And indeed, if you did women as well, you would end up doing about the same number of screens as the current program, which is only aimed at men, and uh, add an incremental benefit as well. Well, that's the point. At the moment, the national... The, well, because women uh, are... I mean, men obviously have a much worse life than women do, <laughs> largely, largely because we die on average, we get diseases on average, particularly vascular disease, about 10 years before women do. Mm -hmm. So, well, it, you might think yeah. that, but it adjusted for that, they still have disease much earlier than women. Um, is something to do with the um, uh, uh, reproductive process too? You've got some, women have got something in their blood that stops them getting pregnant. Yeah, I mean, it's probably called estrogen, basically, estrogen, yeah. yeah. And what we do is we take oestrogen yeah. and we convert it to androgens. So it's based on oestrogen. Yes. We convert it to androgens, which is what makes us all bullish and go out and aggressive and fight wars and things, but it shortens our lives as well. So in result for being rather unpleasant beasts on the planet, we have a shorter life as well. So we burn, our fuse burns quicker. So that's the main reason, frankly, is it's less cost effective for women because women aren't going to develop it until at least a decade after men. Okay, so there are some things that men would like to be equal for women over. One of them would be living longer. <laughs> uh, okay, the other thing that Oxfask has done is because there was a precursor to Oxfask, the Oxford Community Stroke Project, in the uh, early and mid-80s, they can actually compare populations over that near 30 years or 20 years difference. And for example, they've produced some data around atrial fibrillation, AF-related strokes, uh, showing actually it's become a much more important cause of stroke uh, at all ages, particularly the elderly, though, than it was in the 80s. And that's important because obviously stroke is a, a disease you really want to try and avoid people getting strokes because it's not very nice for patients, obviously, um, but it's very expensive, a very costly condition to treat. So it's upsetting for individuals and their family. Um, it's a disease people fear, and it's also very costly. And here, potentially, atrial fibrillation is potentially a preventable cause of stroke because you can anticoagulate patients, stick them on warfarin or one of the newer agents, which uh, effectively reduces the likelihood the blood will clot and then the clot goes somewhere and cause a stroke. So uh, potentially um, we could be preventing more strokes if we were more active at um, anticoagulation in AF than we currently are. Yes, aspirin, in terms of um, stroke prevention, has had its day, I'm afraid. I mean, the accumulating evidence um, is that it is a very poor substitute for anticoagulation. Um, we thought for quite a long time that for people who couldn't tolerate warfarin or found it difficult to control warfarin or didn't want to take warfarin, that aspirin was an alternative. But the difficulty with aspirin is that as we age it becomes less effective and more risky. And beyond about 70, 75 years of age, aspirin actually has no gain to somebody who has atrial fibrillation in terms of stroke prevention, and it has more risk of bleeding. And so guidelines, they've only recently changed, but guidelines now internationally have changed in their recommendations to say that uh, we shouldn't be using aspirin to prevent stroke. If somebody is at high risk of having a stroke with atrial fibrillation, we should be using an anticoagulant. But if they're at low risk? At low risk, then we don't treat at all. So that's the difference. What about prevention? Sorry? What about prevention for a younger person? Well, 
Young people are much less likely to have a stroke in association with their atrial fibrillation. So because their a priori risk is low, unless they've got another problem. So if the only problem they've got is atrial fibrillation and they're under 65, then they have a very low stroke risk. If they, have, um, if they smoke and have atrial fibrillation, then, then that starts to amend their risk. But of itself, it's not a high driver of risk. And the view now is that the risks of aspirin outweigh its benefits in populations of AF. Uh, interesting enough, the Oxfast group, I hesitated to include slides on that, but the Oxfast group, because they've got this longitudinal cohort, have produced some very interesting data around the potential value of aspirin in cancer prevention, which is an entirely new area. And I think we're going to hear a lot more about that downstream because there are very few treatments, chemical treatments, drugs, that, that actually might delay or reduce onsets of cancer. So just at a time that aspirin is becoming less and less valuable in heart disease, it might have a new role in other target diseases. But that's for another talk. What types of cancers? Well, it's mainly adenoma cancers, and that's mainly GI cancers, particularly colorectal cancer. So I think that we've got a, a cancer screening program for colorectal cancer, and I think uh, what may happen, I mean, it's, it's no guidelines currently recommend use of aspirin in this instance because it's still not determined that it is helpful, but it does look promising that use of low-dose aspirin for at least 10 years would uh, provide some uh, reduction in risk um, or progression of, of colorectal cancer particularly. But that, as I say, is research still. It isn't currently clinical guidance. Okay, so the Ox Valve program has is, 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 uh, only been running a few years, so it has got less outputs from it, although they have now nearly recruited the um, 6,000, or is it 5,000? 5, 5,000 patients that they wanted. Again, it's a relationship with the practices sending uh, patients in um, and them getting an echo test, which is uh, testing whether um, they have got certain types of valve disease. Um, and uh, currently, looking at the first 2,500 patients, you can see that actually it's very common. More than half the population that they have screened thus far um, I think it's over 50s. I can't remember exactly. I should have checked. I think it's over 50s um, who they're screening, maybe 55-year-olds plus that they're screening. But a very high proportion have got valve disease. But in the vast majority of those, it's mild and probably doesn't have clinical significance. Well, that's the next slide. So um, it's principally regurgitation mitral regurgitation, mitral stenosis, aortic regurgitation, aortic stenosis, tricuspid regurgitation. So it's mainly regurgitation, i.e. what's happening is the valve is closing, okay, but then it's leaking. So you're getting a bit of black pressure. Okay, and by and large, regurgitation is less clinically significant than stenosis because in stenosis it's tight and it's more difficult to get the blood through, has a much bigger back pressure effect. So those are the valves that are principally affected, but um, you can see in most cases it's only moderate at this point. And um, they're specifically looking at aortic valve disease because that's a more significant valve if problems arise because that's the one that goes from the left heart and is then pumped all the way around the body. And potentially this aortic sclerosis uh, may be amenable to medical treatments. So one reason for doing the cohort is to identify people who might benefit from certain um, investigational treatments. Um, but obviously they'll also follow up the cohort and see what happens to people's valves over time. And they have been quite successful at getting additional funding to do some of these uh, extra questions about particular groups of individuals within the cohort. In the previous Yeah. In this section, you're talking about 5,000. In every case, is the patient informed that they are... Oh, absolutely. And, 
has given their permission. Yeah, I mean, these are all studies. I mean, every study within the BRC um, has been through formal ethics. Ethics require, obviously, that patients are aware that they're taking part in the study. And the way that they're aware is that they get written information about what the study is about, and they actually have to sign to say that they both understand what the study is about and that they agree to take part in it. So, yeah, it's, it's all... With 91,000, that's a very big number of people to get permission from. I thought sure. perhaps if you were just doing it statistically from anonymous records, then perhaps you Yeah, in fact, the 91,000 is the catchment area, ah. a catchment population, so they haven't got 91,000 records um, ah. for OxFask. What you are talking about, though, is the potential of big data, which is using routine clinical records. And frankly, the NHS is particularly well set up for that because we're the most computerized health system in the world, particularly in general practice. Virtually every general practice in the country will record virtually every consultation on their clinical systems. So the potential for us to do this big anonymized data is huge and, in fact, the most uh, used clinical record systems in the world, CPRD, is UK-based general practice records. But as you rightly point out, they're anonymized if you're just going to access them for research purposes. To actually, as soon as you want to do something that, that identifies the individual, in the United Kingdom, you must get individual consent. What there's been some interesting debates about um, is whether one of the benefits of free healthcare in the NHS should be that we automatically agree to some types of research, such as big data research, where nobody's going to do anything to us as a consequence of it, but our information may be used for specific purposes, where you license the investigators, but you don't require every single patient you know, all 45 or 54 million people um, to actually sign on a piece of paper. And it'll be interesting to see whether that, that debate goes on. By and large, scientists and politicians worry a lot more about these things than most patients do. A lot of patients assume we're doing this all the time anyway. Yeah, of the of NHS data. Yeah. 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 Yes, no, I mean, you, at the moment, the, there is this huge debate about it. They haven't launched it yet because it continues to be debated about NHS care data, it's called. Um, and yes, if you have um, said that you don't want your data to be used from your own practice, it, it, well, it shouldn't be being used because that is then uplifted to the uh, data warehouses where all the NHS data is kept. Um, but currently, it's not available anyway, so uh, it wouldn't be an issue. But yes, you're right. Well, hospital data is and it's being misused around the world. Well, I, it, it, you will not have attributable patient data. Yes, you will. Well, that to be honest, is either a, a serious mistake or it's a, it would get people into a lot of trouble, frankly. Would, would you relish having access to that much data? Though? Yes, I think so, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It would make... I mean, as I say, using anonymised data is, is, is already good. You can do quite a lot of things with anonymised data. Um, but just think about it. At the moment, if, you, if we recruit somebody into a trial um, and then we want to follow them up for 10 years, we've got to see them every 10 years to, to, to get the data. And potentially, if you could log onto the clinical systems, you could capture a lot of the follow-up data of that individual electronically at, at vastly reduced costs. So what we might be able to do is reduce the costs of doing big pieces of research and it's often used for hypothesis testing as well. I mean, you won't, you won't develop things on the basis of looking at routine data. But what you might do is you might come up with some good ideas about what could or couldn't be useful. That's going to be the issue for the aspirin in cancer, is that this is what we call observational data. 
it's less reliable than doing a trial. And then we've got to think about, well, what, how would you go about doing a low-cost trial that would then answer the question? So it's good at generating hypotheses. It's less good at testing them. OK, so Oxvask. Um, then the... Um, oh, Bernard Pendergast, I, I forgot to mention that. He was the PI on the Ox valve study. He's a cardiologist at the JR. We've now also got a chronic kidney disease program which I'm a PI with, with Dan Lasserson. He's another academic in primary care and a part-time GP in Oxford. Um, why chronic kidney disease? Well, because it's actually getting more common and we still aren't quite sure what constitutes true disease and what um, are the drivers of disease. Classically, it's divided into five stages and it's based on how well your kidneys are filtering, a measure of filter, if you like, estimated glomerular filtration rate. That's how, you know, the, the kidneys filter in waste products. Um, but really, it probably isn't disease until here. So this impairment of kidney function probably represents a range of normality. Although most people who get to these more severe stages will have got through those stages as well. So we've got a problem because how do you decide that somebody who's in one and two might progress to these more severe stages? And CKD is important because if you get to here, it becomes very expensive to treat because you need renal replacement, renal transplant, or going on to dialysis, very expensive. So you want to avoid that for individuals and for society. Um, but it's also important because it's actually quite an important driver of vascular disease. I'll show you a slide on that in a minute. But this is to show you that where the action really starts is patients with what we call stage 3A and stage 3B. It's a reasonable proportion of the population. That's nearly 4% of the population. So it's reasonably common. Fortunately, the more severe stage is much less common. But what's interesting about it is that if you look at estimated glomerular filtration, and you can see why I said that it's really only, when you get to 3B, below 60 when action starts, is you can see that once your EGFR drops below 75, you get this linear relationship with increased risk of vascular diseases. So you're more likely to have heart attacks and strokes as your EGFR drops. Now, that may not be causal. It's an association, but there may be some factors that you can predict that cause that. And here's another function of renal disease. This is looking at whether you're excreting protein from your kidneys, and it's completely linear for protein. So even small amounts of protein mean you're a bit more likely to get vascular disease, and as that rises, in a linear way, it increases the risk of you having vascular diseases. So it's important because we've already said that cardiovascular disease is important. Um, what's new about um, chronic kidney disease, though, is we're not quite sure what the best way of measuring it is. And indeed, historically, we've been using what's called the M uh, MDRD formula. And what this is doing is plot plotting the estimated filtration rate against the actual filtration rate using uh, what we call a gold standard measure. And you might say, well, why do you bother estimating it if you can measure it? And it's because that's complicated to do that. So you have to do a simple measure. But what you want is it to be in a straight line. You don't want it like the current formula we use, which overestimates the risk of somebody having CKD at the higher levels and gets more accurate as we get low, because that means you end up diagnosing a lot of people who probably don't have kidney impairment. And here's CKD epi, which is a new way of measuring the estimated glomerular filtration rate. And you'd be pleased to hear the NHS is talking about adopting this new measure. And it's not only better at predicting how well the kidneys are filtering, it's also better at predicting people who are more likely to get coronary heart disease. And indeed, um, we're also doing a lot of measurement of this cohort, looking at 
different ways of estimating glomerular filtration. And we're also looking at biomarkers. And here's a good candidate biomarker, cystatin C. And you can see again, it's much more discriminating than the old uh, formulas are in terms of uh, vascular events. So um, to help us uh, start to uh, answer some of these questions, we're establishing OXREN, the Oxford Renal Study, which is a cohort, again, patients over 50 being screened by EGFR, which is a simple blood test. And we're also collecting all sorts of measures here to see how um, their progress over time in terms of their renal function declining. So, oh, um, I mean, basically, the patients would get treated exactly the same as they would do in routine practice. The difference is that they are more likely to be identified earlier if there's a significant um, change to their condition, because obviously, well, not obviously, but in fact, if you get impaired renal function, it's not, it's not obvious. You don't get symptoms. So people don't necessarily realize that they've got declining renal function. And then how that, what we're doing with the cohort is establishing a group of people who have agreed to take part in the study and agreed for us to follow them up. And we'll be looking at different ways of measuring renal function, looking at what seems to predict changes in the future. In terms of their clinical care, the patients get the clinical care that they need through routine services. Well, for these early stages, um, it's principally the same things that you would do for somebody who had high blood pressure. So you want good blood pressure control. If your lipids are very elevated, you'd want good lipid control. You'd want to be more cautious about your salt intake. So it's really healthy lifestyle. There's no special treatment. And that's the other thing about chronic kidney disease. Currently, there's no special treatment uh, available to treat them, but I'll come back to that in a minute. So uh, ultimately, we hope to have 6,000 people in this cohort. And what we've tried very hard to do um, is actually try and produce a population that's reasonably representative of um, the UK, because it'll come as a huge surprise to you to know that Oxford is actually rather a well-to-do city. And, um, and in fact, they have about half the deprivation of the national population. What we've managed to do by being very careful about the practices we've selected is to produce a socioeconomic status of the population, which is closer to the English norm. Um, it'll be even closer once Scotland becomes a different country. <laughs> OK, so uh, that's what we hope to do with Oxren, all those sorts of things um, that I've already talked about. Um, we've also linked through, uh, though, with another group that have looked ju just a subset. And the good thing about that group is that they have recruited in Derby, which has a very, very high proportion of ethnic minorities. So I th again, I think we'll be able to enrich our cohort with uh, ethnic minority populations. And we also are doing a big trial which is coming back to this point about can we prevent the onset of um, chronic kidney disease or the progression of chronic kidney disease. And what we have here is um, basically a very simple treatment, very old treatment, spironolactone, an aldactone uh, reductase uh, inhibitor. Um, and potentially what that may do, because we've got candidate data to suggest it may reduce cardiovascular events within the population, but it may also delay renal decline. So that's a big trial that we're doing in patients who've already progressed to stage 3B. So it's the more severe end of the spectrum. And that's only just started. So theme three is the healthcare, sorry, theme four is the healthcare innovation and evaluation. They're doing two things. They're doing big data. This is anonymized data interrogation. Um, but they're also looking at some health service technology innovations. Um, I'll show you one slide on the National uh, Heart Failure Audit they've done some work on because they're doing some work for 
healthcare providers and whether they can intervene to improve their performance. But they've also taken on um, the biggest repository of data around blood pressure trials in the world. Uh, that's moved to Oxford recently. The lipid treatment trialists collaboration is already based in Oxford. So many of the um, massive uh, database around uh, statins and other treatments that alter lipids have come from Oxford. And in fact, in future, the BP trialist data will be managed from here as well. So here was this uh, NHS heart failure audit, looking at 175 hospitals across the UK. And they've got some quite interesting data here because what you can see is the range of performance is absolutely extraordinary. These patients with heart failure being discharged, most of them should be on an ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker. And you can see in some hospitals, it's virtually no patients are discharged on that. And in some, it's 90%. So looking at what the reason for that massive variation is, that's the big Achilles heel of all health systems, including the NHS, is how can you make the best the norm? There's too much variation in the system. Where the NHS is good, it's better actually than virtually any other healthcare system for much less cost. But let's face it, it's not always good. So actually trying to shorten that gap is important. The intervention study they've done a pilot on is support heart failure, which is pretty simplistic stuff really, because it just gives a little bit of kit, a bit of monitoring, blood pressure, pulse oximeter, weighing scale to patients, and an iPad, and they stick it in the iPad, and it goes to a secure server and goes to the research team. And what they've shown, it's only a pilot, so there are relatively few patients in the pilot, but most of the patients in it, because they tend to be elderly patients who've got heart failure, had never actually used much technology before. They found it very simple to use and very short to use, and they liked it. They liked it even though nothing happened with the information. So they were collecting the information, but the trial wasn't to provide feedback. That's the next phase. But patients liked it because they felt they were more engaged in their own treatment, I think, things like that. And they are now looking at some interventions that would use the technology more in a two-way process. And in fact, they're partially using it for a great big trial in Iran. Hopefully, it's in the south of Iran. Um, but, well, it's actually based out of Tehran, but I think it's a, a community study um, that's looking actually at a simple intervention, the polypill strategy, combined pill that includes half doses of most of the major things that uh, reduce vascular risk, blood pressure, statin, etc. But they're using this technology as part of the follow-up of what is a large number of patients scattered around Iran. And the final theme you'll be pleased to hear, because we're running out of time, uh, is the methodology theme. And what they're focusing on using these scientists is particularly around measurement error and diagnostics. And the reason for that is that Oxford does a lot of diagnostics research, making better earlier diagnoses. Um, and uh, basically, well, they hope to using modeling techniques to come up um, with uh, better tools for both diagnosing but also monitoring patients. That's currently how reference ranges are developed, is you measure as many people as you can with a particular measurement. And then the normal range is defined as uh, two standard deviations from uh, the mean, because that basically encompasses 95% of the population. So it's a bit crude because it basically is saying that if you're within the 95% of the population measure, it's normal. And if it's outside that, it's abnormal, which may or may not be accurate. For example, a good example of that is actually our cholesterol levels because virtually everybody in Western societies, their cholesterol's too high by the time they get to adulthood. And so... Um, what we, what we 
need to do with our cholesterol is generally reduce the population mean nearer what it would be if we were Aboriginal people or the level is when we're born. By the time we get to adulthood, virtually everybody in the population is higher than it should be for a human. And that's because we're lazy. We don't run for 40 miles to catch a kudu. Um, <coughs> we go down to Waitrose and buy over the counter. And that basically, we're not built for that. So what the group have done uh, already is they did a systematic review to look at reference ranges in the literature and look at how um, reliable the reference ranges they were developed. And what was interesting is that actually um, the papers that were looking at reference ranges rarely stated how they'd been derived. So you just had to take it on trust that they'd done a good job. They didn't tell you actually how they were doing it. And as a consequence of that, we've got big problems currently with reference ranges because we're not quite sure. I mean, in some cases, we're very clear that it's a good reference range and we should be using it. But in some cases, we're much less certain. So for example, nearly 40% of the population uh, of some communities in the UK are now on vitamin D because they're supposed to have vitamin D deficiency and we don't know whether the reference range is right for ethnic minority populations. So you, you then start having problems because you're using one reference range derived for a European white population and using it in another population who derive from South Asia. What the group have already done though is identify some areas where reference ranges didn't exist and in fact using a very large um, cohort of children, um, not just from the UK, but actually internationally as well. What the group have done, in fact, based from my own department, it's hard to believe that this is true, but it is true, is that they published the first centile charts that were available that map uh, heart rate against temperature in uh, different ages. And the reason that's important is because obviously if a child has a fever, their pulse rate goes up and you just had to guess whether it was higher than you'd expect for the rise in blood pressure. And this was the first time that there were charts developed to show at what point that heart rate couldn't be explained by the temperature. There must be something additional. Perhaps the child had a chest infection or had some other factor that was explaining the rise in heart rate over and above the temperature. And the final example I'm going to give you from this group is much more complex, but it illustrates the difficulty with some of the reference ranges we use in clinical practice. This is looking at echocardiography. You saw echocardiography used for the valve disease cohort to start with. This is looking at all the measures that we do when we do an echo. It's basically a scan of the heart, and you can measure the chambers. You can measure the flow through. You can look at the valves. You can do all sorts of things. But look at the normal ranges for some of the common measures that are done here. We don't really need to describe what they are, but this is left atria, which is the top chamber, the smaller chamber on the left side of the heart. That, the normal ranges for that were based on 1099 people from Framingham. Framingham is a small New England town in North America, entirely white population. So that is the sum of the reference range. And for some of these, left ventricular mass, 500 white people generated, the um, largely white people uh, generated the normal range for LV mass. So actually we're using reference ranges that are based on really quite small numbers of people. And what we've done with uh, the University of Auckland, um, which is there, so we're here, other side of the world, but um, is try and get as many trials and studies, uh, epidemiological studies that have measured echocardiography and have measured the people that they've measured the echo in very well, try to pull it all together so that we can use those to generate more reference ranges. And um, it's only recently started this, but there are nearly 22,000 subjects now in this cohort and you can see that it's reasonably represented in terms of white and ethnic minority populations. 
uh, predominantly younger people. And I think one of the challenges too is, is to get more populations who are more aged into the database. And I'm just going to give you one example because it is a bit complicated and I'd find it difficult to explain to you. Um, one thing we're going to look at here is left atrial size. I showed that currently that's based on 1,000 Framingham population, the normal range is. Um, and the assumption based on Framingham is that actually left atrial volume doesn't really change very much in a normal population. It only changes as a consequence of disease. That's what we currently think. And yet, it's a good slide to end on because you can tell me what it means. Basically, what we're looking at here are all the individual values across the population. And what you've got, the 95% confidence intervals added here. And these are European men, European women, Asian men, Asian women. And this idea that your left atrial volume in a normal population doesn't change with age is true if you're Asian, but not if you're European. And you can see that the confidence intervals here, the confidence range widens in men as you get older and narrows in women as you get older. So what that's telling you is that for Europeans, you should use age-adjusted reference ranges to decide whether that left atria size is normal or not. Yeah, that's simply because those echo epidemiological studies have not been done by and large, although some are in progress and we are talking to the investigators about sharing their data. I mean, by and large, there are a lot more data in the world on white populations and then second on Asian populations. And by and large, blacks are very underrepresented, except in the United States where they do have some reasonable data in American blacks. Um, but from Africa, very few. Sorry? Yeah, I mean, South Africa has obviously got more of a tradition of research like, um, like Europe has. Um, and as I say, we're talking to investigators who do have African cohorts. They tend to use ECHO differently, though. Because they, this is not just looking at how they're used in clinical practice. In South Africa, for example, more echoes will be done in very young people because they've got a completely different spectrum of disease. Heart failure being common in young people there through AIDS and rheumatic fever and things, which you know, is less common here. What these are are research study populations where populations have been screened. Is it fairly helpful to start with? Sorry? Is it fairly helpful to perceived to be normal. They might not be, but they don't know that they've got disease, so they're being screened, and then you can develop the normal ranges from that. I think that's the last slide it is. So there we are. We are bang on time, but I'm quite happy to take any final questions.